Everyone has one of these cards. Yeah, yeah, it is. But I still can imagine that there are people who don't want to uh, leave their uh, personal uh, stuff uh, behind in the cash register. Their footprints. So, yes, yeah. their footprints, yes. The cash will never, will never disappear. No, no. It still has some tradition, having money. It's more, um, how do you say that in English? Tangible. Yes, that's the word. <laughs> do you think then it would be a kind of sad day if this yeah. was a purely yeah. cashless yeah. society? Yeah. I guess, yes. It has something special. Real money. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. That report by Anna Holligan in the Netherlands, where cash is no longer king. And that's it from This Business Daily. Hello, this is the BBC World Service. Every weekday at this time, we'll be bringing you World Service Essential. Short extracts from some of our most thought-provoking programmes. We have to be guided by the facts, not fear. Until we understand what that means, we haven't really understood anything. The BBC's global exchange of ideas. We're shared on social media, what not just the news. Why do we do the things we do? More from we all those corners of the sleep. world later in the programme. Today, it's the essential from our own correspondent, the programme that brings you analysis from BBC correspondents, journalists and writers from around the world. Move over Great Wall of China. The Great Mall of China is gathering ground in the English countryside between London and Shakespeare's birthplace. Bister Village, the name pronounced with the hearty local twang as Bister, is a designer shopping outlet of international renown. Famous as a place to find luxury goods with impressive discounts. Six million people come here every year, 60% of them tourists from outside the UK. The Duchess of Cambridge has been known to pop by, but just now you're more likely to meet Chinese visitors, sometimes fresh off the plane from Heathrow, with their luggage still sporting its airline tags. But this morning I've beaten them to it, arriving before opening during Britain's busiest retail season, the time between Black Friday and the January sales. Oh, yeah, do you wish While the trains, fall? coaches and limousines are advancing, the assistants are polishing countertops, replenishing stock, the doormen are pristine. The valet parkers await their first car keys of the day. A sign in the money changers lists the currency rates. It's an eye-opener. Dollars, Euros, then Swiss, UAE, China, Saudi Arabia, Russia, Hong Kong, Thailand, Kuwait, Malaysia, and there's an instant tax refund desk for travelers, liberating more cash to spend. The overseas visitors are seasonal. Just now it's predominantly Chinese, but Middle Eastern numbers fluctuate for summer and Ramadan. There is a contemplation room next to the Dior shop. It's well stocked with prayer mats and copies of both the Quran and the King James Bible. A reminder that while Vista is now a magnet for international shoppers, it began life as an outlet store on the edge of a small Cotswolds village once known for its country fairs. I've chat to a woman called Lucy over breakfast at an Italian cafe. Quintessentially English, down to her quilted jacket and crisp blouse, she and her husband could be Vista Village ambassadors. They live nearby and love the place of bargain, yes, but above all, the impeccable service. Overseas customers flock here, but it's also giving British customers what has fast disappeared from their own high streets. The sales assistants yes, are international yes. customers. A cheerful greeter from Poland was in a seasonal job, but already felt at home. They like family, she said of her colleagues. And all have tales to tell about Black Friday in important America, when the visitors shopped till they dropped past the Passing the last train to London. Unlike Cinderella's, their designer party dresses have not turned rags in the process. The assistants take the volume of bargain hunters and the pride in one busy designer store. A single woman carefully polishing the glass handrail to mirror perfection. That must be like painting the fourth bridge, a well-known British expression for a job which, once completed, needs starting all over again. She didn't understand me, but quickly alerted a colleague at the counter. And even as I tried to explain, she went down the shop floor that an English customer required attention. And I was swiftly greeted by a woman who hailed from Bista herself. There's a universal aspect worth noting in the designer bags. Not the handbags themselves, but the glossy designer carrier bags, which hang off the shopper's wrists, elbows and shoulders in all sizes, 
containing everything from lipsticks to, well, handbags. Riding up the double escalator at Prada, one of several stores whose deceptively modest outlet entrances open up into lavish, posh interiors, I peeked into a bag headed downwards and spied, folded neatly inside, several more smart designer carrier bags. All presumably heading back to China, the Middle East or beyond, as souvenirs. Back at Vista Station, the London-bound shoppers alight from the shuttle buses like oriental kite sellers. Their origami sails or carrier bags threatening to carry them along should the wind pick up. One Chinese couple excitedly tell me about their bargains, their bags conspicuously hanging off a large pink case on wheels. My own designer purchase is behind me. When I finally succumbed to a bargain pair of party shoes, they came from a unique outfit. Possibly the only shop in Vista Village not putting its goods into glossy designer carriers. When I surprised myself by commenting so you my that Vista turned me into a label hunter too. This is Christine Fern from our own correspondent here on the BBC World Service. For more from our own correspondent, go to bbcworldservice.com. Documentaries on the BBC World Service. It's my first time. I'm really excited. I'm nervous, though. For 100 years, people have been crossing the oh, USA and Great Wall Now. Oh, oh, oh. I'm Laura Barton, and I'll be climbing aboard for a meandering journey from Detroit to rural Kansas. It's our job to get you safely down the road that you have the best experience on the bus that you can have, considering that it is a bus. Meeting my fellow travelers. I usually sleep most of the way anyway. I sleep really good. Cool. Okay. And listen to their stories. That's why I love Public Greyhound. It's like you meet some of the best people and some stick with you your whole life. Greyhound 100 on the BBC World Service. Online at bbcworldservice.com. Did you have a tape for it? Oh, yeah. All right. Hello, I'm Steve Crossman and this is Sport Today. Coming up, a new development in the tragic case of Albert Ebosse. We know that he died in August following a match for his Algerian club side, but was he killed by an object thrown from the stands, as was previously reported, or was he murdered after leaving the pitch? We'll hear from the pathologist in his native Cameroon who claims lies have been told about the circumstances of Ebosse's death. We'll have more on Sport Today after the... BBC News. President Putin has tried to calm fears about the Russian economy after this week's dramatic slide of the ruble. So Mr. Putin says measures now being taken to stabilize the would work, but he accepted that the government could have acted sooner. Mr. Putin acknowledged that Western sanctions had contributed to Russia's difficulties, but he said that their goal was to undermine Russia's independence and not, as the West claimed, to punish Moscow for seizing the Crimean Peninsula from Ukraine. As he was speaking, the European Union announced tighter restrictions on investment in Prime Minister. The Dutch Prime Minister, Bart Rutte, has pulled out of an EU summit to deal with a political crisis at home. He's fighting to save his coalition after Parliament rejected a package of health care reforms to cut government spending. India has condemned a Pakistani court's decision to grant bail to the man accused of masterminding the deadly attacks in Mumbai in 2008. An Indian official said the release of Zakir Rehman from jail was unacceptable and urged Pakistan to reverse it. Residents of a village in northeastern Nigeria say suspected Boko Haram militants have killed at least 33 people and kidnapped dozens of others. The military in Cameroon has killed more than 100 militants who attacked an army base. Opposition MPs in Kenya started a debate in Parliament on controversial new security legislation. MPs shouted down other speakers and sang protest songs. Later, a fist fight broke out. The government wants the measures to tackle al-Shabaab militants. The European Union's top court has ruled that obesity can be considered a disability in certain cases, if obesity on its own does not warrant special protection. Judges say that if a person had a long-term impairment because of their obesity, then they would be protected by disability laws. BBC News. 
Hello, I'm Steve Crossman, and this is Sport Today from the BBC News Service. Thanks for joining us. Coming up on the programme, we hear about the end of Auckland City's remarkable run at the Club World Cup. What can we say? I mean, we are very proud of the way we competed in, in, in a game like that against the South American champions, you know. For a club coming from New Zealand, it's an amazing uh, effort and an amazing uh, success. That's their head coach, Ramon Tribuliec. We'll hear more from him later in the programme. We start today, though, with the tragic death of Albert Ebosse. Cameroonian player died following a football match for his club side in Algeria in August. Today, a pathologist in his native country has told him today that he believes the footballer was attacked, assaulted and finally murdered. The official cause of death in Algeria is that he was killed by an object thrown from the stands. But Dr. Andre Moon, who has examined a boss's body, believes he suffered injuries that indicated signs of a struggle, including a blow to the head, a ruptured cervical vertebrae and a stab wound to the shoulder. Dr. Moon says the initial account of what happened to Albert Abosse is a lie. Those lesions on the head cannot be linked to an object coming from the people inside the chamber. Because an object like that is not a massive object with a higher speed pressure, like the one he received on his head. And even for the broken part of the skull, it cannot be linked to such a projectile. Are you saying that the Algerian report, which said that Albert Abosse was killed by an object thrown from the stand, is a lie then? Because it seems that's very different to what you have found. Yes, they have lied. Because perhaps at the beginning of the process, they were making to that football player. They didn't know that it could be sanctioned by a death, a mother of a man. At that point, they didn't know how to manage the next events coming. When we saw the conclusion of their reports, they didn't mention that fact in their report. There was something, an object thrown. They only said that Albert Ibose died naturally after a football game, without any mention of that battle. You have written a report about what you found. You've sent it to the authorities. Do you hope and expect that uh, a new investigation will now begin into the death of Albert Abosse? We have tried our We have tried our best to fix the legend by making color photographs. We have tried our best to fix the legend by getting x-rays. We don't have any problem. If they want to do any other research, according to me, we are open to that. They didn't know that we can do autopsies here, but we are open to that. No problem. What do you hope will happen next, then? By doing our, our autopsy. The fact is that by doing our autopsy, we knew that it is an international problem. We took many, many precautions to do a scientific report. We were very aware and very precautious to try and be close to the fact of things. We were aware that our report is going to go around the world. There were denials that we have not done this autopsy, but we did it. We did it because we wanted to ask the questions asked by our justice here in Cameroon. That's Dr. Andre Moon, who examined the body of Albert Bosse. I'm joined in the Sport Today studio by a football reporter, John Bennett. John, what's being said then about all of this in Algeria right now? Well, the Algerian sports minister, Mohamed Tami, has said the government won't be making any comments because he says the file is now in the hands of the Algerian justice system. Meanwhile, the press agency, AFP, are quoting somebody who they say is a senior official from Bosse's club, JS. Kabali, who they say wish to remain anonymous. According to them, they say Abosse fell on the pitch before getting to the tunnel leading to the dressing room. So that was the original version of events. The club president, Mahand Sherif Hanashi, is yet to make any comment. We've contacted the, the Algerian Football Federation. So far, though, we've had no response. Interestingly, though, from what I've seen, this story does not seem to be making very many headlines in Algeria at the moment. And there's one other confusing aspect to this whole situation. If Bosse's family have also claimed that nobody from the club, JS Kabali, went to the funeral and they didn't fulfill their promise of paying for the funeral. Well, I've spoken to 
an Algerian journalist in the last hour. He's strongly denied by J.S. Kabbali. So there's very much two sides to these two different stories. Okay, thank you very much to our football reporter, John Bennett. You're listening to Sport Today on the BBC World Service with me, Steve Crossman. Wednesday's we brought you the story of Sami Issa, the Nigerian striker who went from playing domestic football on the Pacific island of Vanuatu to the semi-finals of the Club World Cup, all of that in less than a month. Well, the adventure for Issa and his team, Auckland City, is over. He came on in extra time as the New Zealanders were narrowly beaten by the South American champions, San Lorenzo. It means they miss out on facing Real Madrid in the final, but their run from the playoff round is nevertheless remarkable. But as Auckland's Spanish coach, Ramon Trifuliec, has been telling our world football programme, their scorer against San Lorenzo, Angel Belanga, was more disappointed than most to miss out on a meeting with the European champions. Angel is actually a Real Madrid uh, fan. He uh, he's a season ticket holder, so you can imagine how disappointed he was after the game. You know, he felt uh, we we had a great chance. I mean, every player out there felt that we we had an unbelievable chance. I mean, we had a wonderful opportunity to to win the game in the uh, in the last uh, ten minutes of the game. What can we say? I mean, we are very proud of the way we competed in, in, in a game like that against the South American Championship for a club coming from New Zealand. That's an amazing uh, effort, an amazing success. Definitely the gap is closing. I mean, anyone can play the game really well at a very good level now around the world. The A-League in Australia is getting better and they have a great structure, you know, and that's providing them with an opportunity to have uh, full-time players. That means that they're playing big games every weekend and, and that's only good, you know, to, to develop players. And us, you know, we, we are getting better. Our league's getting better as well. We are not full-time, but the amount of good players has increased. So I'm not surprised. You know, it's, uh, I think it's good for that side of the, uh, the world. You know, we have been forgotten probably at football for a long time, but we are putting our heads uh, out there right now, and hopefully we'll keep doing that in the near future. That is the head coach of Auckland City, Ramon Trebuliac. We're going to stay with football because the Professional Footballers Association in Serbia have urged players not to sign for clubs in the country. And that's because there's a good chance they won't get paid. FIFA Pro, the World Players Union and the Serbian Players Union have warned players of severe financial problems in the country's domestic league. Eight of the 16 teams in their Super League have been unable to pay employees after having their bank accounts blocked by the Serbian National Bank. Alex Kerstinovic is a football journalist in the country. He says the problem is particularly keenly felt by players from Africa. Now, the African players did use uh, Serbia as their route to Europe. Uh, you know, to come to Europe to play at the European club and then hopefully with their good uh, performances have another club in the world. Um, I do see a problem with it, obviously, because many of them, especially the, the agents, would not like to be confronted with such problems uh, regarding payments. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, they don't have much choice especially the players from uh, smaller African countries who dream about playing in Europe and uh, uh, so there's one of the solutions for them and even though they are not paid uh, what is still honored or what has to be honored is the fact that the club sooner or later have to pay the contracts uh, exactly through the uh, actions of FIFA player and uh, the actions of FIFA and the actions of the Serbian uh, Football Association uh, that uh, simply the clubs can simply not go around, they can wait all the time they want, but again they have to pay uh, the wages uh, that, that, that cannot be paid. That is exactly the case of Red Star Black World, who was not allowed to play in the Champions League this year because they had so much uh, depth. To, uh, to former players and uh, UEFA said this is now enough uh, you will not play in Europe this year until you pay all your debts to, uh, to the former players that's Alex Kerstinovich, the sports editor of Sportskirt Centrala. Now, can you remember what you were doing six months ago today? Well, the answer, unless you're listening from Spain, is probably not. The reason I say that is it was this day six months ago that Spain were knocked out of the World Cup in the group stage at the Maracanã. The stadium, of course, which also hosted the final. That's such an icon. 
But what's happened to some of the other grounds, which we told you before the tournament, were in danger of becoming unused and, dare I say, unwanted. I'm joined by Julio Gomez from the BBC's Brazilian service. Julio, as I say, we painted a pretty grim picture before the tournament about what might happen to these stadiums. Um, is that picture any prettier now? <laughs> Hi. Well, uh, yeah, not m not much. No. Uh, basically, what is, what is happening now in Brazil, what we see now, is basically what we thought uh, the scenario we thought we would see, uh, and everybody was debating before the World Cup, which is the stadiums that belong to clubs or that are used for big football matches, like São Paulo, Rio, Alegre. Belo Horizonte, they are most often enough, enough they are crowded, they are full, actually we had an increase of, of attendance uh, in the Brazilian league and it has to do with those new stadiums, uh, but the so-called white elephants, the stadiums that we imagine uh, they would be an, of no use after the World Cup, in fact, uh, we had a couple of events here and there, but most of the time there's nothing going on in, this, in those stadiums and it seems it's a matter of time in two or three years we're going to see most of them abandoned and a lot of public time wasted. Yeah, that was kind of going to be my next question, Julia. I mean, how many stadiums would you say potentially could be in danger of, of even being shut down and, and removed because they are unused? Yeah, well, I, I don't think I don't think any of the stadiums is, is, is in danger of being shut down. I think that would be a, a, a radical uh, decision that no one would want to take here in Brazil. No politician uh, would take this decision or this kind of decision. That would be like a, a shot in their feet. Yeah? But uh, we have three stadiums, uh, four stadiums that were called White Elephants, one in Natal, one in Brasilia, the ones that everybody questioned before the World Cup. In fact, Brasilia won, which was very expensive, uh, one of the most expensive stadiums ever uh, in the world. Uh, this stadium, it, it, to be honest, it has been used uh, for other events, uh, apart from football, uh, concerts, uh, private events, and things like that. But Manaus, Cuiabá, and Natal are in really in real danger. The Cuiabá government, for example, uh, the, actually the state of Mato Grosso, they are already talking about selling the stadium for a private, private company, or putting it in private hands to see how it goes. Uh, but obviously it's going to be hard to find anyone who would want to, to buy a stadium like that. And, and Julie, I wonder if we can end on, on a positive note, because of course we're building up to the Africa Cup of Nations at the moment in Equatorial Guinea, a tournament which is not completely but partially being built from the ground up. Do you have an example for us in Brazil of a success story on this front, a stadium that is being used almost to its, to its best possible level? Well, uh, I think it's the, the stadiums uh, that are in the big centers. Uh, for example, we had a brand new stadium here in São Paulo. Uh, the stadium that was built for Corinthians, the, the, the biggest club in the, in the city, or the biggest number of supporters. And they never had a stadium. Yeah, in their history, Corinthians never had their own stadium. They always played in someone else's stadium or public stadium. And Corinthians, Corinthians built uh, this stadium uh, in a very poor area of the town, in Itaquera. Uh, it's a very poor neighborhood. They have 30,000 people uh, there every match, every single match, as they always had. And obviously it's a different public, different kind of people are having the opportunity of seeing their team uh, uh, at least closely. Or not having to travel one hour to get to the center of down to, to, to see Corinthians playing. So it was a very good party that really brought uh, football to, to a new uh, to a poor part of the town and, and it's a good it's a it's a successful successful thing. Julio thank you so much for joining us on Sport Today. That's Julio Gomez from the BBC's Brazilian now successful American sprinting coach John Drummond has been banned for eight years and one of the men who trained Tyson Gay gave key evidence of his prosecution. 
The second fastest man of all time cooperated with US anti-doping in order to get his own suspension reduced to just one year. I've been speaking to Larry Adair, editor of Run Blog Run. He's been telling me about Drummond, a man who he believes now has a reputation for tactics. And that story is a case that's been watched very closely by coaches, trainers, and the sport. Um, I tend to believe that when someone tests positive or someone is given a ban like this, it's an important moment for the sport. It's also a sad moment. Um, coaches are role models, not only for you know athletic endeavors, but for life. And uh, as a former coach, I think you've got to protect the profession. I applaud uh, the, the AAA and WADA and USADA for imposing the ban. I wish it had been a lifetime ban, just you know, from my viewpoint. But um, um, that's where I stand on it. And how big a name is he within United States athletics? John has been pretty well respected in the Olympic athletes. Uh, uh, Olympic athletes. Uh, John respected as a coach, not only in track and field, but with American football. Uh, and my contact with him, he's always been quite affable, uh, good interview, thoughtful. Um, when I first heard about this, uh, I think it was over uh, a year ago, a year and a half ago, uh, I was pretty surprised and sad. But the, the issue is that doping in sports is about cheating, and it's about hiding things, and it's about lying to your friends and those places. And so, you are going to be surprised if someone um, is convicted. This is an example of a, a new strategy, I guess, as well, of, of not just going after athletes, but going after coaches too. This is about more than just John Drummond. Oh, I agree. You know, again, co coaching is a profession. I'm at the U.S. Track and Field and Cross Country Coaches Association. It's the biggest coaches meeting in the world. And last night they gave awards to... Um, uh, to two young athletes, Laura Rossler and Dion Lendor, uh, the Bowerman Award, and to be with coaches in a profession that I respect uh, is important. And therefore, when someone violates our standards, violates the coaching standards, they have to be punished. And I think Wada and Strata are on the right track. You've got to make the award so draconian and the chain so big that when people consider doping, they go, not Unfortunately, there's so much money in sport and other people value, I think, in an unsport way. That, um, I think 95% of dopers are caught right now, but I think that we've got to do this to catch the, the ones that we're not catching. Larry Adair, the editor of Run Vlog. Let's turn our attention to squash now because the Women's World Championship is taking place right now in Egypt. A report from Adi Abidoin is there for us. He's been speaking to the home favourite, Karim Darwish. He explains why Egypt has been so dominant in the sport. Well, I think we have a factory that <laughs> that uh, that may make some uh, squash players. But I, no, I, I think I, we have uh, the best coaches in the world. Are, uh, they live in Egypt. Uh, uh, we have, uh, like in every uh, sporting club, we have uh, more than 15 or 16 uh, squash courts. So squash is very popular in Egypt. I think it's the second uh, most popular sport after uh, after football. So, um, yeah, everybody in, in Egypt loves squash. I think it suits the uh, the genes of Egyptian uh, 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 people, I think, because uh, Egyptian people, are, are I think they are uh, very smart and they love the, uh, the, the sport that's the that, you use your brain inside the court, and uh, so I think we're, uh, that's why we're very uh, good in squash. And uh, as I said, we all had uh, an idol to look up to. I think every team is there to look up to. So I think uh, it's a kind of uh, you're a former world number one, yourself, former world junior champion, former world finalist. And you make an interesting point. As long as you keep being successful, you keep producing talent for people to aspire to. Yeah, of course, because uh, as I said, the, the, the juniors, they, they, they would love to, they, they, they usually come and see us uh, train and, and they imitate us uh, in our uh, daily routines and uh, they, they try to, uh, to do the, the same that we're, we're doing. So uh, we've been doing this for the last, I think, uh, 20 years. We always had uh, uh, an idol and uh, a big champion in front of us. So that's why I think... Uh, we're producing uh, 
very good talent and uh, uh, as I said we have the, the best coaches are uh, in Egypt. And what does it mean do you think to the country hosting this event here? What you, mean, you talk about squash being the second most popular sport probably more successful than the football team. So what does it mean for the country uh, having a tournament like this here in well, terms of growing the sport? Well, it's, I think it's a big, very big uh, event to, to host uh, like the, the most prestigious uh, event in, in squash uh, in Egypt because, um, as you know, the last uh, few years we had uh, some troubles in uh, some trouble in Egypt uh, after the revolution and uh, a lot of people said that uh, the tourism uh, went down a lot but this is a, like a clear message to, uh, to all the world that uh, Egypt is still, uh, is still up we're, uh, we're having uh, uh, 17 countries playing in, in our tournament and they're safe they went to the pyramids yesterday, uh, yesterday. they went to, to all the, uh, the touristic places so, uh, so it's, it's a clear message to everyone that uh, Egypt is still safe Egypt, uh, can host uh, a world-class event, so uh, I think it's a very big uh, thing to Egypt. That's Egyptian squash favourite Karim Darwish speaking to our reporter, Adi Adidon. Finally then today on Sport Today, World Rugby's leading point scorer, Dan Carter, will end his international career after the 2015 World Cup. He's doing it to become the sport's highest paid player. The New Zealand fly half is joining French club Racing Metro on a three-year contract. Effectively, that means... He'll be retiring from the All Blacks because they don't pick players who are with clubs outside of New Zealand. Carter is the latest high-profile rugby star to be courted by the high wages on offer in France. We can get more on this with our rugby union reporter, Chris Jones, who's joined me now. Chris, this is another coup, I guess, for the, for the French League. Oh, absolutely. I think this is the one that so many of these presidents and chairmen at the French top 14 clubs really, really wanted. Yes, Carter, perhaps it is in the twilight of his career now. He'll be uh, 30 three after all uh, during the World Cup and then 34 when he really starts getting into his rugby in France so he is getting on a bit in rugby terms but still a legendary figure all-time record point scorer over 100 caps for the All Blacks and even though he is being paid a huge amount of money by that it's a big clue to the clubs what he will bring away from and the English Premier League, not least, Steve, because actually the success of the French Top 14, all the money, all the glitz, all the glamour, all the big names and the stardust, actually hasn't translated into success for the French national team. They've actually been struggling, partly because of the proliferation of foreigners into the league. That must ring many, many bells for our, for our listeners uh, from England who uh, will have been lamenting the form of the England national team compared to the success of the Premier League. But certainly when it comes to, to rugby union in the Northern Hemisphere, there is a bit of an imbalance with a place like Wales or Scotland where there isn't a great deal of money in the club and regional and provincial game. In England, th there is a fair bit of money around and they're desperately trying to keep pace with France. But as we've seen with Carter's example, uh, however much money an English club would have thrown at him, the French can throw that little bit more. Yeah, Chris, my next question was going to be what the impact will be on New Zealand and, and more specifically, how will they cope? But I guess because of injury and a few other issues as well, they've, they've kind of learned to cope without Dan Carter? A hundred percent. He's not played much rugby in the last year at all for New Zealand. And we've seen two, three, four younger fly halves come through, Aaron Cruden, Bowden, Barrett, Collins, Slade, to name just three, and they will prove themselves as, as world-class players. There will be talent coming through in New Zealand. Yes, they will miss Carter. They'll miss his experience. But New Zealand just breeds rugby players of rare quality. And actually, even though he is moving on after the World Cup, there, there was a case that actually he perhaps in a year or two's time may not merit his place in the New Zealand team. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's working out well for everybody. Carter gets a big payday, which he deserves for his brilliant career with New Zealand. And New Zealand after the World Cup can kind of draw a line on the Dan Carter era and look to the future. But as you say, they have been adept in the last year at bringing through the next wave. So in terms of Carter and quite hard position, New Zealand should be just fine going forward. And finally, Chris, the, the words I always see before the name Dan Carter are World Rugby's leading 
I wonder now, is he still the pull venue because of his ability or because of his status? Is he still good enough to, to command being the sport's highest paid player? I think we're going to find out the answer to that, Steve, over the next seven or eight months. Because as we touched upon, Carter hasn't been a big part of the New Zealand setup for the last year because of all of his injuries. If he can get back to form and fitness and steer New Zealand to another World Cup, he'll go to France with his reputation in France. We'll just have to see how 2015 pans out. But certainly, even if he isn't the same player on the pitch for Racing Metro as we've seen over the last decade, off it in terms of what he would bring to the merchandise, sponsors, shirt sales, uh, I'm sure that the $1.5 billion plus may be worth uh, every single cent. Chris, thank you very much for joining us. That is our rugby union reporter, Chris Jones, speaking to us on uh, Before we go, let me read some of your social media messages. We've been asking you what you think about stadiums being closed after major tournaments. A story today that seven of the 12 stadiums from the Brazil World Cup could be in danger. Oli in Ghana says, I think it matters most in Brazil because they're a football nation. Their stadiums should be busy at all times. Compare it to other countries. The Brazil Football Association should wake up if they are sleeping. Ben Carnu has been in touch to say, actually, I think if a stadium isn't doing anything for a country, it should close. Shinshasha says, I think closing them isn't the best idea because so much money is spent on putting them there in the first place. If I was there in Brazil, I'd recommend the stadium to be used by local clubs that are willing to maintain. Well, I think, to be honest, in Shasha, they are being used by local clubs. The problem is they don't have enough fans to fill them. Thank you very much for listening. That's it for today from Sport Today. The BBC World Service. Witness tells the story of great moments in world history. The former Indian Prime Minister, Rajiv Gandhi, has been assassinated. The crowd just froze, and then everybody started to stampede and ran in all kinds of different directions. History told by the people who were there. I thought I had had a rendezvous with my destiny. Witness on the BBC World Service every day. This is the BBC World Service. The monsoon season in India sees many rural homes destroyed because they're made of clay and straw. But as we'll hear in Science in Action at 19.30 GMT, a new plastic brick might be the answer. The newsroom is next. This is the BBC World Service, the world's radio station. It began immediately after. Two waves of expansion. Is that the war? President Putin attacked the West for conspiring to weaken Russia. Hello, I'm Valerie Sanderson. A man accused of masterminding the 2008 Mumbai terror attacks is granted bail by a Pakistani court as the country mourns people killed in a Taliban attack on a school. You know, I can still smell that you know, bloody scent that was at that moment. I have not slept for two nights. We are moving from one funeral to the other, picking up the bodies of our friends. It is, it is terrible. He was a man who people looked up to. One person described him as the encyclopedia. It's the man who go to to find out about medical issues. President Putin has tried to cut the US South Russian economy. The highest is the amount of slide of the ruble to record lows. After the ruble plunged in value this week, President Putin's task was to reassure Russians and the markets that he had the situation here under control. So he came out in support of the central bank, saying its actions to prop up the ruble were adequate and correct, though it should have moved faster and more decisively. Mr. Putin admitted that there were hard times ahead. The economic slump could last up to two years, he said, and could mean spending cuts. Though not on defence, he said, or on pensions and state wages. President Putin said the goal of Western sanctions was to undermine Russia's independence and not as the West play to punish Moscow for seizing the Crimean Peninsula from Ukraine. As he was speaking, the European Union announced tighter restrictions on investment in Crimea to take effect from Saturday. European cruise ships will not be allowed to enter Crimean ports 
and companies in the EU will be banned from oil and gas exploration in the Black Sea. India has condemned a Pakistani court's decision to grant bail to the man accused of masterminding the death of a tax in Mumbai in 2008. The sole surviving gunman had identified Zakir Rehman as the mastermind of the attacks which killed 166 people. BBC reporter in Delhi, Salman Ravi, says India is very unhappy with the Pakistani court's decision. India has reacted very strongly after the news of bail being granted to Zakir Rehman like we came in and uh, the uh, spokesperson for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Sayyid Akbaruddin. He said that Pakistan cannot be selective in uh, its approach towards terrorism and said that India is disappointed. The European Union has taken in Borno state by members of Boko Haram. One man said as many as a hundred had been seized. <laughs> 